Hello, Bible-believing students. I'm Matt Mahan, and welcome to the Bible Truth Commentary. These broadcasts are designed to give Bible-believing Christians concise verse-by-verse -verse teaching from the plain text of the King James Bible. We've been studying the book of Mark, and in chapter 1 here so far, we have seen the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first few verses, uh, John the Baptist coming to announce the arrival of, of the, the Great One, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we uh, began to look at his baptism. Uh, we'll complete the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then his temptation in the wilderness. <clears throat> so as we've seen previously, uh, John shows up uh, out in the wilderness. All the people leave Jerusalem, Judea, trekking for 20 or 30 miles to come here. Um, John the Baptist preach, preach repentance, preach that there's one coming after him, um, who will uh, pick up uh, after he's completed with his uh, um, proclamation of his arrival, uh, this baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then the Lord Jesus Christ uh, shows up, and as we saw in our last study, was baptized of John. And John says to Jesus, he says, uh, uh, I, I have need to be baptized of you, and do you come and baptize uh, to be baptized of me, and um, Jesus doesn't say, well, I'm a sinner too, and I need to confess my sins, <clears throat> but he says that, uh, uh, allow it to be so, because in so, in so doing, we're going to fulfill all righteousness, and so in obedience, John baptizes him, and we pick up here in verse 9, came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Now at this point, um, there's a parallel passage. Jesus is about 30 years of age, we're told, in uh, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, because he wasn't really because of the virgin birth, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And then going down through the lineage, all the way back to Adam, and uh, so why is it important then? He's 30 years of age, um, at which time he's to be manifest to Israel and actually begin or be inaugurated into his earthly ministry, which will last three and a half years. Everything up to this point be in preparation, even his, even his childhood and youth preparing him for what God had. But why 30 years of age? And um, my opinion, apparently no other reason than that it, uh, it was God's perfect plan. Now, there's different theories on this, of course. Um, the book of Numbers uh, begins the ministry of the prophets, um, or not the prophets, the priests, at age 30, Numbers 4, verse 30. So some say, well, it's because the priesthood began at 30 and Jesus was a priest, and that could very, very well be. However, that age was changed at later to 25 in Numbers 8, 24. And then again, in 1 Chronicles 23, 24, the age of the priests being initiated into their um, uh, public ministries uh, began at the age of 20. Uh, and then according to Ezra 3, 8, this would be after the captivity of Israel and after they came back from the Babylonian captivity, um, that age was still 20 years of age. So uh, um, I'm not sure that's really the reason, but... Um, Jesus comes from Nazareth of Galilee. He didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth of Galilee. And, of course, other accounts of the Gospels tell us why. I think maybe one of the reasons why maybe God had him raised there was uh, to keep him in relative obscurity until it was time. And, and this is just, you know, just my feeling on it. Um, because up until the time when he embarked on his earthly ministry, his Private life is kind of kept kind of private. He's kept out of the limelight. And even when he came into the temple with his parents, you know, it caused a big bustle because he knew so much of the law and had such understanding. He was standing there with the doctors at 12 years of age, hearing and telling them things, and they were just amazed at his knowledge of the scriptures. So God kind of kept him out of view. And this is my opinion. And uh, until it was time for him to be manifested to all Israel and begin his earthly ministry. Um, 
So he comes from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. In verse 10, it says, And straightway coming up out of the water, implying immersion, baptism by immersion, he, John put him under the water, and he came up out of the water. You say, well, why is that important? Because everything in the Bible is important. Even though baptism might not have anything to do with your salvation, it's still obedience. And, uh, and I believe biblical, scriptural baptism is a form of obedience. If you're going to obey God fully, well, put me under the water completely. And so uh, Jesus coming up out of the water straightway, directly. And that's one of those Gospel of Mark words, immediately, straightway. Um, the gospel of action, the gospel of being the servant, the gospel of being the effective man, and uh, which would appeal to the Roman mind, to the Gentile mind, uh, coming straightway up out of the water. It says, he saw the heavens opened. Now, there's only a couple of times in, in the Bible where you see heaven open. In the book of Revelation, you see heaven open twice. In uh, Revelation chapter 4, John sees heaven open, and he's caught up. And then in Revelation chapter 19, you see heaven open, and Jesus comes back. So heaven opens the first time in Revelation, someone goes up. Heaven opens the second time in the book of Revelation, someone comes down. Heaven opens here in the Gospels for what purpose? For the purpose of God putting his stamp of approval on his Son. Jesus looking up into heaven, being the perfect, holy sinless, promised Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, getting baptized and beginning his earthly ministry, God does a wonderful thing. He opens up heaven and opens it up to his Son. And the Spirit, it says, like a dove descending upon him. Of course, you know the emblem of the Holy Spirit is the dove, and the dove speaks of peace, and it speaks of purity, The you know, the white dove, and, and so forth. And um, <clears throat> so, the form of a dove here. Now, there are some that, and this is what this is. The importance of this is God's putting his stamp of approval on his son. He is saying, okay, this is my son. This is the one. This is the, the Messiah that's promised. And here's proof. And here's a miracle. You know, the Jews require a sign. These signs were required uh, per the Old Testament and per the Jew. And, and 1 Corinthians um, um, one twenty four, uh, I think it is, uh, says the Jews require a sign. Yeah, but uh, anyway, this sign then, this stamp of approval, this, this verification that Jesus Christ was indeed who he said he was and who God promised would come is manifested in this way. And not only that, but also the voice coming from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So, um, <clears throat> There's a parallel passage there. I'm going to turn to it in John chapter 1. I'm going to read a little bit in John because you get a little bit more information in John. Mark shows us, you know, what Mark wants us to know, what God wants us to know through the writer of Mark, but John tells us more. John 1 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom, and by the way, he took away the sin of the world. Now, whether you're forgiven or not, Jesus paid for everybody's sins. Whether you're quote unquote the elect or not, he paid for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world, not the elect, okay? And so he taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Why? Well, he always existed as God. I mean, yeah, he may have been born in a body. And even John, you know, he was born first. He was born six months before Jesus was. So uh, why is he, uh, um, which is preferred before me, and he was before me, why is Jesus before John when John was born first? Well, because Jesus is the eternal Son of God, see? And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, in my come baptizing with water. But Jesus came, uh, John came, to ba baptizing and baptizing Christ to manifest him to Israel. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but that, uh, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which 
baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son, capital S, of God. So, the parallel passage then clearly shows that God is affirming that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. And Jesus is publicly being anointed by God the Father and God the Holy Spirit to meet the demands of his ministry as being the genuine Son of God. <clears throat> and also, you might notice that in this passage, you see the, the Trinity. People say, well, the Trinity is unbiblical. The Trinity is biblical. You might, might not find the word Trinity in the Bible. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right here, you've got God the Father speaking from heaven, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You've got God the Son being baptized, and you've got God the Holy Spirit abiding upon Christ. Now, um, at this point, this same spirit that uh, abode upon Christ at his baptism now drives him into the wilderness. You would think now that he's anointed for his ministry, he would go right on out there into a successful public ministry, you know, God bearing witness with signs and wonders and miracles, but it wasn't time yet. God had one other thing to do yet, and that is to prove his son as being holy and untemptable by the devil. <clears throat> and so he drives him where? Not into success and a great, you know, limelight, but out into the wilderness to be tempted of the, of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. And so uh, verse 11, and there came... A voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then it says, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. There was no time. Right after that, he, I picture Jesus turning and leaving. Why? Because all of this attention is focused on Jesus. It's not time yet, but he's being shown. This is the Messiah. Here's the baptism. Here's the great sign of the Holy Spirit descending on him. Everything looks ready. And then he turns on his heels and goes out into obscurity. Why? Because he's got some business to take care of. He's going to face the tempter. He's going to face the one who has caused all of this trouble in this world, and that's Satan. And uh, so he, he goes out to be tempted. And the word tempted of the devil here in verse 13 uh, is a continuous action. It's not just a one-time or a three-time thing. You know, they say Jesus was... The Bible says he was uh, tempted at all points like we are yet without sin. Uh, and, uh, and that's true. You know, and you got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in 1 John. And if you look back in Genesis 3, there are three presentations of the fruit um, to the woman. You know, pleasant to the eye and making someone, making you wise and, and uh, desirable to eat and so forth and so on. And, the, and, the, and these three different, yeah, those are the main temptations. But... The idea here is that the Lord Jesus Christ was being tempted for the entire period of time, and these were culminations of these three tempta type areas of temptation, these primary areas of temptation. But they're only samples of the intensity of the temptations that came during that period of time, and that's what we're given. That's the, what's recorded in the scriptures as to what happened. And uh, now... Uh, notice that these are temptations, not testings. Jesus didn't need to be tested. Uh, there was nothing in him to test. He was, he was the son of God. Uh, he, he wouldn't give in to sin. But there's a, there's a difference here, and sometimes people are confused because, you know, sometimes the, the same word is translated tempted, and sometimes it's tra translated um, tested. But uh, uh, the testing... Uh, whether it's good or evil depends on the intent of the one giving the test. Um, the Bible says in James 1.13, let no man say when he is tempted, tempted, um, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither, neither tempteth he any man. So Satan tempts us to do evil, but God does not. God might test us, but he isn't going to tempt us to do evil. He might let the devil, he might give permission for the devil like he did Job, to tempt him. But uh, what Satan intended as a temptation to sin and disobedience here, God intended as a use of demonstration of his son's holiness and worthiness. Um, like, for example, Joseph in the Old Testament, you know, he told his brethren, his brethren were sorry that they threw him in the pit, but Joseph became king of Egypt and he sustained him through seven years of famine. And Joseph said, oh, no, 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 don't worry. Because what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And, um, so, you know, temptation 
uh, we're told to count it all joy uh, when we encounter temptations. Uh, James 1, 2. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says God won't allow us to be tempted above what we're able. It doesn't say God tempt, tempts us. It says God won't allow us to be tempted above what we're able. Uh, but will with the temptation give a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Now, when temptation comes, it comes in four phases. Okay, first of all, there's the presentation. You know, think of the garden back there, okay? The, the fruit, you know. And, and the devil said, uh, Yea, if God said, you know, shall you not eat of all the um, fruit of the tree of the garden? Uh, and shows them the fruit. Presents the fruit to the woman. That's the presentation. Then illumination. At that point, when that presentation is made, when that idea comes in your mind, and the devil will put those ideas in your mind, sometimes they'll just come, you know, due to your own nature. Uh, but once it is presented then there is illumination on that temptation. You become aware of that temptation, and whether it's right or wrong, your conscience answers to it. And if you hear a sound in the background, it's my dog back here. This is Ella. Uh, but there's illumination on it. Now, have you sinned at that point? No, you haven't sinned at that point. You haven't done anything wrong. You haven't given in to the temptation. The temptation's been presented. Now you've seen whether it's right or wrong. Where temptation enters in is where you begin to debate whether or not you should commit that sin or whether it would be okay to do it. And, uh, and then at that point, then you either choose to follow through. You might repent and go back, or you can follow through with it. And that uh, I call commission. But evil or sin doesn't enter in until after the illumination. And that's why it's so important for you to fill your mind with the Word of God. Wherewithal shall a young man tempt his, to change, um, cleanse his way? Uh, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. And uh, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 9 and 11. And uh, so he was in the wilderness with a wild beast. Now, if you look at Genesis 128, God had given all of the animal kingdom to Adam to take dominion over. And he had lost the dominion of that kingdom in the world. Adam was a king. He lost that kingdom. And the, the Bible is a struggle between two kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God, okay? And those are in conflict all the time, and they, they, they are represented by two cities, actually, Jerusalem and Babylon. And uh, so that's why it says, you know, he was with the wild beasts. Now, verse 14 brings a handoff to, uh, from John to Jesus. Now, after that John was put in prison... Uh, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, so Jesus was there in the, temp in the wilderness, uh, 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him, it says in verse 13. And then after John is put in prison, Jesus comes into Galilee and preaching after the temptation. Now, more detail is given on the temptation in, uh, I believe, Luke, um, I don't know, Luke chapter 4. Um, and uh, there's three presentations, three temptations that the devil gives to Jesus, and Jesus is triumphant in all of them. Now, here he comes preaching the kingdom of God, and notice it's not the kingdom of heaven, and you'll notice sometimes it's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and we'll get into this more in the next um, increment of our study. We won't go into detail about it now, but... Uh, I've wondered for many years, why does it say kingdom of God sometimes? Why does it say kingdom of heaven? Because it's the, it's the same word, but then when it was, uh, when the New Testament was written, sometimes it was heaven, sometimes it was God. And why did it happen that way? Well, in short, the kingdom of God is a moral, internal, righteous kingdom with God dwelling in your heart and all of the attributes and, and moral goodness of God being displayed in you. It, it, it's an it's a internal, moral, spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is a literal, visible, physical, messianic kingdom on earth where Jesus comes to the earth and brings the kingdom of God there and rules on the throne of David. And that's where the Bible's talk about my king, thy kingdom come in the Lord's prayer and, uh, and, and various things like that. So um, here the kingdom of God, it's, it's the kingdom of God here, as opposed to the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you, if you go to the companion Bible, 
There's an Appendix 114, which I think does a very good job in contrasting the difference between these two kingdoms. And, and I'm going to give them to you real quick, um, summarized here. The kingdom of God has God for its ruler, while the kingdom of heaven has the Messiah for its king. The kingdom of God is in heaven over the earth, while the kingdom of heaven is from heaven under the heavens and upon the earth. The kingdom of God is unlimited in scope, while the kingdom of heaven is limited in scope. The kingdom of God is moral and spiritual in sphere, while the kingdom of heaven is political in sphere. The kingdom of God is inclusive in its nature, embracing the natural and spiritual seeds of Abraham and the heavenly calling and the church of the mystery. Um, while the kingdom of heaven is Jewish and exclusive in its character. The kingdom of God is universal in its aspect, while the kingdom of heaven is national in its aspect. The kingdom of God is, in its wider aspect, the subject of the New Testament revelation, while the kingdom of heaven is the special subject of Old Testament Jewish prophecy. The kingdom of God will be eternal in its duration, while the kingdom of heaven is dispensational in its duration. And by that I mean a period of time that God dispenses where he works out his plan. The kingdom of heaven is only limited in scope to that time, and Jesus is showing up to proclaim the potential beginning of this kingdom of heaven, which was rejected by Israel, whereas the kingdom of God continues. And we'll talk more about that, but that will help you to better understand What's going on in this transitional period where the Messiah shows up and presents the kingdom, but he's preaching two kingdoms. He's preaching the kingdom of God, and he's preaching the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven is the one he came to the Jews for. And the kingdom of God is what the kingdom opens out into after the Jews reject their Messiah and the kingdom program is postponed and God brings in this period of time called the church age, which is a mystery where all believers, Jew and Gentile, are accepted in God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all we have time for today. I know I got a bit long-winded, but uh, this is all good stuff. And we'll pick up with the, uh, uh, the beginning, the actual beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he calls um, uh, Peter and Andrew and begins calling the other disciples and... Uh, uh, skips a lot of material in the other gospels here and goes right into right into the, uh, the the earthly ministry of christ and i hope this study has helped you understand the bible in some way uh, if you have any questions or would like to contact me please feel free to email me call me uh, the information is given in my post here on youtube um, and uh, if it was a blessing to you by all means share it with your friends uh, feel free to share it and, and uh, give me your suggestions. Give me your comments. They're always welcome. If you don't agree with something, that's okay. I'd, I'd like to hear from you and uh, discuss uh, anything. I'm still a student of the Bible. I, don't, I never considered myself to be graduating. Uh, we're all just students of the Word. And hopefully uh, yeah, this will help you to become a stronger student of the Bible through these broadcasts. May the Lord bless you and increase your understanding of his word.